nice to talk to all of you. It's actually been a few years, so uh, I know I miss being here. Uh, so uh, my goal tonight is sort of to cover both some things I think some of you, the regulars I see in the audience have probably seen before, but also some of the, the new material and I even tried to squeeze in. I, we were downloading a tag that we picked up yesterday and it didn't quite finish downloading. So I put some of the material uh, just from uh, uh, literally uh, hot off the press. So, uh, But I do wanna cover, uh, focus on three different species, blue whales, humpback whales, and gray whales. I probably won't bring fin whales in too much. Oh, it's not supposed to do that. Uh, and, uh, well, that's interesting. Let's try that. Okay. Uh, and talk a little bit about their status because there's some interesting new developments with each of these species. Uh, and especially some of our ongoing work, which also focuses on some of the threats that have been emerging with these three species. Some that we've been studying for a number of years, some that have really increased just in recent years and have changed like the entanglement risk. Uh, that's occur. Um, and then I want to save a little time. I think uh, those of you who have seen my presentations and before I try to show some of the uh, video and data we get off some of these tags. Uh, we have some new video tags and uh, I'll show you some old video and some new video that we've been getting uh, both of how we deploy these tags and some of the insights they're providing. So again, three species. I will mention that gray whales, uh, I I'm going to talk Oh yeah, I just thought of a slide I should have put in here for you guys. So, so remind me uh, when I get to gray whales because our focus of our gray whale work is actually on what's called the Pacific Coast Feeding Group. Uh, and while there's some 20,000 gray whales that migrate by, that's a group that feeds off the Pacific Northwest. And there's some new things that have come out on that group that have come thanks to the Channel Islands uh, uh, Naturalist Corps uh, that I, I meant to show you, but I didn't put that slide in, but I'll tell you about it. Uh, anyway, now I'm going to start with uh, just a few things and humpback whales first. Uh, one of the new developments that happens, happened with humpback whales since uh, I've spoken last is that uh, NOAA has changed their uh, status under the Endangered Species Act. And in particular, prior uh, to that change, humpback whales under the Endangered Species Act were considered one unit. So they were either endangered or threatened uh, or not listed worldwide. And one of the, the very significant changes is the recognition of what are called distinct population segments. So now, instead of evaluating the status of humpback whales as one unit, there are actually 14 of these distinct population segments that are recognized. And because of the language of the Endangered Species Act, that's all defined by breeding area which is actually kind of inconvenient because uh, those of you who remember some of the results from the splash study we did years ago, humpback whales actually show quite a bit of loyalty to specific feeding areas. Uh, and often they'll disperse to multiple breeding areas. But the nature of laws and how they're written because the ESA talks about breeding units, it had to be defined by breeding areas. So all of these 14 areas which are shown on this map uh, are, are by breeding area. And, Relevant to us are four, uh, which are numbered on here, three in the Western North Pacific, four Hawaii, five Mexico, and six Central America. Those are the kind of relevant units uh, that were evaluated. And what's crazy is these different colors tell you that under the Endangered Species Act, each of those had a different status. Uh, so uh, humpback whales in Central America and the Western North Pacific uh, remained endangered and the Endangered Species Act. Humpback whales off Mexico were downlisted to threaten, and humpback whales in Hawaii were delisted. Uh, so that was a pretty dramatic change. In, in some ways that might sound to you like it's going to reduce protection um, of humpback whales because some are delisted, but I actually think this recognition of these units actually will increase protection. Uh, it's an important and very realistic move. Prior to that, you would consider under the Endangered Species Act how something impacts the entire pop, you know, world population, if you will, or if you treated the North Pacific as one unit, you know, uh, a higher risk of entanglement on the California coast would be treated as part of some bigger uh, unit under the Endangered Species Act. Under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, there were still some protections that applied, but this recognition actually provides greater protection. And I actually think we're actually seeing that come into play because with the increased entanglement risk we've been seeing, I think some of this will actually trigger 
protections that would not have otherwise come into play under the Endangered Species Act. So this recognition of separate units is really important. And generally in, in conservation, uh, the smaller the units you recognize, the greater the protections you provide. Because when you have really large units, then any kind of impact is divided into this much, much larger uh, area. Uh, and so by doing these smaller units, there's a greater recognition and evaluation of that on a much more local level. Uh, so again, now this creates kind of a complexity for the managers in, of uh, humpback whales on the West Coast, because suddenly you're dealing with humpback whales that might be endangered, they might be threatened, or they might be delisted, depending on where they're coming from. Uh, so it's actually increased the degree of interest in for the feeding areas and the places that we study humpback whales and the primary, when you think about <clears throat> humpback whales spend time on breeding areas and feeding areas, and you can think of that as maybe two parts of their life, but really it's dominated by the feeding areas. It's where they spend most of their time. They're spending typically eight, nine months on the feeding grounds and just a few months, if not less than that, on the breeding grounds. Uh, the feeding grounds are where they're most, most loyal to, and the feeding grounds is where most of the impacts occur, whether it's uh, fishing entanglement, exposure to ship strike, threats of that nature. Uh, so that's why a lot of that conservation focus is on these feeding grounds. Uh, but now we need to be, be able to evaluate that very potentially different status of humpback whales based on which breeding ground they're coming to. So we've actually, in the last uh, year, uh, substantially escalated our humpback whale program. Many of the uh, number of people in this room have participated in the Channel Islands Naturalist Corps. It's been a key source of photo IDs uh, for our ongoing research. And now a key part of that work is using that as a basis to assign, you know, in each feeding area, uh, what portion of humpback whales are coming from which breeding area and what their status is. Uh, this, you know, to show you, it's actually pretty complicated. This is from the splash study. This, these lines connect recitings of the same individual humpback whale between those breeding grounds and the feeding grounds. We ended up with hundreds of these matches in the uh, splash study. These are color coded by which breeding ground they came to. So under this color coding scheme, red would be the uh, endangered humpback whales. Uh, then you have these Mexican humpback whales. I don't know what color that is, green? Green uh, is Mexico, and over here, that looks more like yellow, uh, are those that went to Hawaii, and you get a little bit of a sense. You know, part of what came out of the splash study was that there wasn't this very simplistic, as we had initially viewed it, link between breeding areas and feeding areas. You know, and, uh, I would say prior to the splash study, we tended to think there was a Hawaii, Southeast Alaska group of humpback whales and a West Coast, Mexico group of humpback whales. But instead, you see from Hawaii, humpback whales are actually fanning out. Very few of them are coming to California, Oregon, but really from Washington all the way around, even over here to off Russia, uh, those different humpback whales from Hawaii are dispersing. Uh, and very similar, uh, a very similar pattern from the offshore Ray Valledos. The humpback whales off Central America tend to almost exclusively go to the US West Coast. And as I'll show you, that endangered group of humpback whales is one we have to be concerned with because the area they occur in highest proportion is Southern California. Uh, so we have a high portion of these Central America now endangered humpback whales. Uh, now, one way to think of that, which I use this figure, this is from some work using the splash data that Paul Wade has been doing, um, is to almost think of humpback whales as different herds. Uh, you know, rather than viewing at this confusing thing, there's a, a particular herd of animals that goes from Central America to the U.S. West Coast. You know, in, uh, in Hawaii, you might have multiple herds of animals, some of them, you know, going over here to Washington, D.C., some to Southeast Alaska, some to the Gulf of Alaska, some to the Aleutians. You know, and these arrows each represent a different herd. And those arrow sizes roughly represent some of the sizes, how many animals are represented by that. Uh, and we're using this to kind of assign proportions of animals in different areas and where they go. And I won't belabor this point because we're actually adding to this quite a bit right now with this new expansion of research. Um, uh, I was just describing that our humpback whale photo ID effort has been really hampered over the years as our catalog has gotten bigger, as we've gotten more and more contributions, uh, as that population size of humpback whales has increased. And I'll show you some of that trend data. Uh, 
keeping up with all of that matching has become more and more difficult. And we've had a recent breakthrough that we're really happy with. We'll be presenting this at the Marine Mammal Conference in Halifax and have a, a publication on this. Many of you have heard about attempts to develop automated matching techniques for humpback whales. Uh, none of those programs have we felt have really uh, come up to the standard of what we can do with the human eye until now. Uh, and there's a new program uh, developed by the computer vision uh, program. We've been collaborating with it. Uh, and we actually ended up with a 95% success rate in finding matches in this automated system. And it's a combination of two techniques, a pattern recognition program, uh, and also one that uses the trailing edge and the nicks and notches on the trailing edge. And some of the failings of past programs is they tended to do one or the other. Uh, and this, uh, this combination of these two techniques uh, has been very powerful and we've been quite happy with it. In fact, when we ran, we, we took our 2014 humpback whale matching, all the IDs, including from down here, that were obtained. Uh, and we had matched through them in thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of matching. Uh, and we ran it through these programs. Uh, and as I said, it found over 90% of the matches, but it also found 21 that we could use. Uh, so we were quite impressed by, by that. So that's gonna help. Oh, I, you know, I this is a nice complicated figure I prepared for you, but the main point I wanna make from this is here you have the US West Coast, and here you have five different graphs, and these show the proportions of animals in each of these areas corresponding geographically to this map that match these different breeding areas. And what's interesting is you see this gradient uh, in the proportion of animals going to different breeding areas. For example, Southern California and South Central California here have the highest proportion of Central America animals. Uh, and then it drops as you go north, dropping to virtually zero by the time you get up to the Canadian border, British Columbia. Uh, and then uh, the other predominant area that we have represented in mainland Mexico, you can see, you know, uh, animals go to mainland Mexico all along the coast, but you'll see it actually climbs as you go up the coast and peaks in central and northern California and Oregon and then starts to drop back down, which is where Hawaii and the Rey Vallejo start to take over. So you see this in interesting gradient. And, and this is, uh, you know, on, on the one hand, I think this is great information to kind of figure out that assignment of where humpback whales are coming from, but it's also a much more complex arrangement than we had anticipated uh, that that would vary. Uh, by that. That's kind of interesting. Maybe it's because I'm standing on the core here. Let's see if we can keep that from happening. Um, maybe I'll get to, I've always thought it'd be a good challenge to do this without any slides. So <laughs> we might get to see how that goes. Uh, so that's been really useful uh, to do that and shown that there is this gradient that exists along the coast. Uh, oh, that's kind of out of order. Interesting. Okay. We, we've, got, we've got a few technical difficulties. Sign in here. Hold on. Let's see what we can do about that. Okay. Okay. I may just, uh, we'll see how this goes. Uh, now, the other interesting thing that's happening is the trend in humpback whales and what's occurring with that. And uh, what I've taken here and what I'm hoping you'll see shortly is going to be the trend in humpback whales uh, that have occurred along the US West Coast. And this is using those photo IDs and, and computing a mark recapture. Uh, and what you see here is our updated mark recapture. Uh, it shows when we started our research, we actually started it in the late 80s. There were uh, less than 500 humpback whales along the US West Coast. And those numbers have steadily increased. I think if you've seen my past presentations, this is about a seven to 8% increase that's been occurring. The interesting new development is that you'll see those have leveled off. So as of starting about 2010, uh, the increased numbers of humpback whales you know, have plateaued. And the three different lines you see there are actually three different mark recapture models uh, that we've used. I actually think this top one is likely the most accurate one. Uh, it's one, it, it takes account of some heterogeneity bias in how we sample the humpback whales. So that's why it's a little higher than the others. It's, adjusts for that, whereas the other ones don't take into account that bias. Uh, but all of those models show populations having leveled off. And I think that has really significant implications for some of the other changes we're seeing in humpback whale, both distribution, uh, occurrence, and some of the entanglements 
that we're seeing, and I'll, I'll try to link that in. Um, but we think this is very real. Uh, it seems like it's even occurring in other regions of the North Pacific, uh, and it makes sense. We don't have a great estimate of humpback whale historical abundance that's actually being developed in a new model that uh, we participated in earlier this year that might start coming up with that. But I think that model will end up showing this seems to be very consistent with, at last, the recovery from commercial whaling, which continued off the US West Coast through 1966. So there were whaling stations that operated that primarily targeted humpback whales, uh, two of them operating out of San Francisco Bay through 1966. So that's not that long ago. Uh, that's certainly uh, in my lifetime, in the lifetime of many of the older whales. Uh, but I think now we're finally seeing that recovery from that. Now, some of the things that we've seen that have gone with that, that we think are related, is that in a number of areas, we've seen changes in humpback whale distribution and occurrence. Down here in the Southern California Bight, it used to be that you would only rarely see humpback whales kind of south of the Northern Channel Islands uh, that'd be caught maybe early or late in the season. And last year and the year before, there started to be regular sightings in places like Newport Beach, we started to get sightings in certain places through the summer in northern Baja. Uh, so I think that was humpback whales sort of starting to exploit what I would call peripheral habitat, maybe feeling a little bit of that food pressure as they reach that carrying capacity. Uh, maybe not involving a large number of whales. Uh, also in San Francisco Bay have been increasingly humpback whales coming into San Francisco Bay under the Golden okay. Gate. Yes. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So kind of groups coming in and feeding, and I, that's kind of, I think, part of that exploitation. We've seen the same thing up in Columbia River, uh, and most dramatically up in the Salish Sea at the very top of that map. Salish Sea refers to the Strait of Juan de Fuca, Puget Sound, and the Strait of Georgia. And it's an area that, that humpback whales used to occur, and even over winter, through the early 1900s. Uh, and they occurred in large enough numbers that a whaling station uh, was established near Nanaimo to kill the inside waters humpback whales through the winter because they could actually continue hunting. And they only operated three or four years before they effectively wiped out the hundreds of whales that used that. But I, you know, we hadn't seen, we'd only seen occasional whales coming into that Salish Sea, and now we're seeing pretty dramatic increases in numbers. Uh, for example, this is taking a plot of sighting reports of humpback whales in the Salish Sea. And you can see that in the late 2000s, it starts to increase. Now, unfortunately, this data is not uh, <clears throat> from systematic surveys. So it, it probably exaggerates that increase because as more humpback whales have appeared in the Salish Sea, the whale watch boats have started to actually target them as one of the species. It used to be all about just killer whales in terms of the whale watching in the San Juan Islands and out of uh, Victoria, but now, uh, they also target humpback whales and also some of the gray whales that I'm going to talk to you about in a little bit. But that, that trend is real, that that has increased dramatically. Now, another factor that plays a key role in humpback whale distribution, it isn't all just about the reach carrying capacity. This came out of a paper that uh, the tops cut off, but this was uh, Allie Fleming, uh, a PhD student at UC Santa Cruz that we worked with, took all of our historical skin samples that we had collected and did stable isotope analysis on them uh, and looked at stable carbon and um, isotopes of carbon and nitrogen. And what she found is shown is actually in these top two figures and it's laid out by year from the mid 1990s through 2012. And you'll see this middle band here from 2004 to 2006. You'll see a pretty dramatic shift in both the carbon and nitrogen stable isotope proportions. And that shift was, uh, was, uh, would, be, uh, would match if humpback whales suddenly started feeding at a higher trophic level. And what we think it, that represented was a shift from predominantly krill feeding to predominantly fish feeding. Humpback whales can switch between the two. Uh, and that's what we saw in this case here. And what she did is she assembled other data. For example, anchovy abundance. Well, it seemed to increase in those years as well, matching that. Indications of krill abundance, well, those were low in those three-year periods. So you can see that middle period, 2004 to 2006, it looks like due to shift in oceanographic conditions that affected 
both anchovy and krill abundance. The humpback whales predominantly shifted, and that was detectable uh, in these stable carbon and nitrogen ratios in the skin samples we had collected. And along with that comes a major shift in um, where humpback whales feed. They tend to feed on anchovies very close to shore. That tends to bring them into areas like close to Moss Landing in Monterey Bay or into San Francisco Bay, other areas like that. Those are areas with, uh, where there are schooling fish, whereas krill abundance tends to be highest out at the shelf edge. Uh, so we see this shift. And I think this will play a role in this entanglement story I'm going to tell you about as well. Now, what's interesting is correspondingly blue whales, they can't shift prey. And what we did see in the mid 2000s was that matches when I show you the blue whale trends, a period that we had lower sighting rates of blue whales off the US West Coast. And I, it seemed to match these uh, uh, photo ID matches we obtained in that period where hump, uh, blue whales that we typically saw off California were being sighted up in Alaska. So when there was lower krill, humpback whales shifted their prey and stayed in the same areas, but shifted habitat. Blue whales voted with their flippers uh, and traveled to you know, other areas because they can't do that prey switch. Now, I think all of this plays a role in this dramatic increase in entanglements that have occurred for humpback whales. So uh, this shows the uh, whale entanglement records per year off the US West Coast going back to 1982 through 2016. And you'll notice the last two years have seen this huge spike in entanglement rates. I mean, two impressive levels, you know, uh, over 50 reported entanglements uh, in each of those two years, 2015 and 16. And this includes a variety of species and entanglement types, but dominating this sample has been uh, entanglements of humpback whales and primarily Dungeness crab. Uh, there are a number of these that aren't identified, so there's a mix of these in here, but that has played a key role. And I think uh, some of these changes we've seen in humpback whales, both their increase in abundance, and I think that increase in abundance and reaching carrying capacity means they're spending more time on the feeding ground, they're exploiting more peripheral habitat, might bring them into more coastal areas. Um, and uh, that and some other changes that were going on in the fishery, the Dungeness crab fishery has been doing extremely well. And in 2015 and 16, there were some unusual events that you know, resulted in greater Dungeness crab fishing uh, in areas like Monterey Bay, especially extending later into the season. The peak time for that fishery is generally winter and early spring. It does extend into the summer, but a domoic acid outbreak extended that much later in the season. And so I think it was a combination of these factors, changes in the fishery, increased numbers of humpback whales, changes in distribution, uh, all resulted in this big spike that there's been an entanglement rate. So this has now been one of the dominant things both within NOAA relative to protection of humpback whales uh, has taken a hold. Uh, it's also mobilized many of the Dungeness crab fishermen. There are actually working groups that are now formed in California, Oregon, and Washington all actively trying to work to try to get ahead of this problem. They recognize this is a very serious issue for their fishery. Uh, they don't want to see it tainted. You know, I've, I've been at numerous meetings now, you know, and heard kind of their recognition. They don't want to see what happened to the tuna dolphin issue happen to their uh, fishery. So they're very actively wanting to look at what can, they, what can they do to, you know, change gear and make modifications to reduce this. Uh, and this is, you know, there's some things that are coming out of this. Uh, you know, there is, uh, you know, various cards, how to report uh, entangled whales. Uh, there's been a real beefing up of the disentanglement efforts. Uh, some of you are familiar with that. That's been very active in California. Uh, I've been primarily involved. There have been a few of us that are kind of designated uh, level four disentanglers. Uh, it's been a role I've been able to play up in Washington State. Uh, but that, that role, you know, that's not the solution to the problem because it's a, a very tricky way to, to reduce that. And in fact, just as of a few days ago, some of you may have seen the news, uh, um, one of the lead disentanglers in Canada on the East Coast was killed a few days ago in a disentanglement effort. And correspondently, NIMS has actually sent a directive to all the disentanglement uh, volunteers and efforts to, to cease operations until that's reviewed. So they're actually, uh, disentanglement efforts are currently suspended uh, pending the review of that case. 
uh, you know, why are humpback whales vulnerable to this? I, I just, these are some uh, photos I took here in the Santa Barbara Channel just last year just to show to some of the fishermen. Uh, humpback whales, as many of, you, many of you have been on the trips have seen, they like to interact with things in their environment. Sometimes that'll be with the boats that you're out with, uh, but often it's kelp patties or kelp beds. Uh, and you can well see that not only are there hundreds of thousands of these Dungeness crab pots up and down the coast that a whale might run into, but I actually think the whale behavior might actually attract them and cause them to interact with some of this gear, just like we see them do with other objects in their environment where this whale was intentionally going into this kelp patty again and again to kind of play and drape it over all parts of its body. Uh, one of the ways we're using the photographs some of you have been involved in, in collecting has been to look at the scarring rate on the flukes of animals. It's almost a third of humpback whales show signs of scars that are from having been entangled at some point in their life. So it's really prevalent uh, in how often they become entangled and many of them getting freed or freeing themselves. One of the things we're trying to study is a huge number of the entanglements in the last two years have come from Monterey Bay. And one thing we can't tell is, is that because where most of the entanglements are occurring or is that just where there's uh, so many whale watch boats and so much education about entanglement that they're much more effective in spotting and reporting. them. For example, up where I do some of our, we, uh, you guys know me from doing surveys out here, but uh, a lot of my surveys are up in Washington. That's where Cascadia is based. And in those areas, we'll get reports of a humpback whale. One will come in and it'll never be followed up with it. We'll never hear another report of it again because there's so few people out on the water off the Washington coast, far offshore where the humpbacks are, that the chance of our relocating, we can only find that humpback whale to try to disentangle it. If someone calls us and it's early enough in the day and we can get them to stay with that whale, that we have a chance of getting there in time to launch a disentanglement effort. So consequently over the last decade, there have only been about a dozen of those disentanglement efforts that I've been able to engage in where we can actually have a chance of trying to free some of those animals. Uh, one other new development is uh, we did publish a paper last year identifying various biologically important areas for both humpback and blue whales. Uh, that's available on our website. Uh, it integrated both all of the opportunistic sightings uh, and sightings from multiple sources to identify some of these key feeding areas for humpback, blue whales, and gray whales along the U.S. West Coast, but it also integrated that with major efforts that have been done by Southwest Fisheries Science Center researchers to do uh, habitat density models. Uh, and so this is an example of, for example, for, uh, uh, in this case here, blue whales, uh, you'll see the color scheme is actually that habitat density model that paints this whole Southern California bite red in terms of predicted density of humpback whales. And then you see some of the circled areas we've identified as these biologically important areas where we've seen large concentrations of uh, humpback whales, or in this case, blue whales feeding. Uh, so we use that to identify and integrate those two efforts. Um, and unbeknownst to us, this has actually been used to a greater degree in some of the management and even some of the uh, negotiations that occurred between the Navy and environmental groups than we expected. Uh, I almost feel a little guilty because I think uh, uh, we had no idea it would be used for some of the applications it's being used for. But I think it is one useful tool uh, uh, that has, has proved valuable. Now, up at the upper right, you see that trend that I showed you for humpback whales. With blue whales, our trend still remains fairly flat. Uh, and embarrassingly, I haven't updated this figure, uh, but our trends are still in the same direction of about uh, you know, 1,500 to 2,000 blue whales estimated for this Eastern North Pacific population. And what's been interesting is that the abundance from the line transect surveys, which matched our mark recapture estimates, you know, but these dropped in the mid 2000s, especially across those years I mentioned where krill abundance was lower. Uh, those have come up a little bit in recent years, but uh, I meant to put the new figure in here that uh, showed that, but it's still fewer blue whales overall feeding along the California coast than we're feeding in the 1990s. Uh, but our overall abundance for the population is holding stable. So a bit of a, I know, a bit, bit of a, uh, a complicated message there. I think the population is going well. There was a paper that came out two years ago uh, that I liked some aspects of. It tried to model 
used some of our data on current population, but tried to integrate that with the historical whaling data. And it used that to justify and show blue whales were likely at carrying capacity, had already hit that plateau level that humpback whales are just hitting. Uh, what I didn't like about their paper, it's also a paper that tried to speculate that uh, the risk of ship strikes wouldn't threaten blue whale populations. And I thought they used some underestimates of the level of ship strikes, but also their model, you know, any model of population abundance, especially one that has density dependence, always will tend to show the population trying to recover to its level. So it basically concluded you could kill hundreds of blue whales a year uh, and it would still be okay. Uh, and what it ignored is that there weren't any other threats to blue whales. Uh, there weren't any environmental changes occurring, uh, that that was all staying the same. Uh, there weren't increases in ocean noise or other threats or things like entanglement occurring as well. It just analyzed this, you know, any, just the one source of mortality, could it sustain that? Uh, <clears throat> uh, like, uh, you know, blue whales are a little more simple, and unlike humpback whales, uh, we think there's basically one eastern North Pacific population that ranges from the Costa Rica dome here all the way up into the Gulf of Alaska. And I won't belabor this figure, but it's kind of some updated numbers of how many unique individuals we've identified in different areas and some of the interchanges uh, among them. This figure was actually primarily to show the interchange with the Costa Rica dome uh, and the fact there was a new match, which uh, we don't quite know what to interpret, but for the first time there was a match that crossed uh, the equator between uh, this Eastern North Pacific Costa Rica dome area and this area in the South. We actually had one individual uh, that was in common there. Okay, I think I already talked about that. Uh, how are we doing? I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna pick up the pace a little bit because I wanna get to some of the tag results. Uh, I always do this. I kind of get wrapped up in earlier parts of the slideshow. Uh, I mentioned uh, gray whales and our focus on that Pacific Coast feeding group. That's this group that feeds, it's shown in green here, PCFG for short. Uh, it's along the route of the overall Eastern North Pacific population that tends to come up here to Arctic areas to feed. We also have a group of, hump, of gray whales that comes and feeds inside Puget Sound. We've nicknamed it the Sounders. Also the name of our local soccer team, if you follow soccer. But no, no, no relationship, of course, uh, between those. Uh, and, and that's, uh, you know, we did the same kind of biologically important areas assessment. Uh, what's been interesting is in the last two years, we've really upped our research on that group of animals, primarily because they feed heavily on ghost shrimp. And there's a fishery for ghost shrimp. And one of the unique ways they feed, I mean, it fascinates me that this group can do this. They come into extremely shallow waters uh, around Whidbey Island, and at high tide, they access intertidal areas. So this is an area of mudflats exposed at low tide, and each of these little dimples that you see is actually a depression in the mud about six feet long and three feet wide made by a feeding gray whale. So it's wild that you're looking at the feeding area of a gray whale on dry land because they're accessing it during high tide and there's barely enough water for them to get in there. They're on their sides. You see parts of flukes and flippers as they struggle to get in there. And we have these huge tides uh, up in Puget Sound, 15 foot tides. So there is a fair amount of water there, but it leaves very quickly if you're a boater and <laughs> you know the risk that you face in a mud flat like that. So this is this incredibly high risk strategy that these whales have discovered. And I feel embarrassed. I've been studying these particular whales since 1990 is when we first discovered this group of animals. And it's the same individuals uh, since 1990 have been coming and doing this. And we, I only recently put together, uh, there were two time periods that gray whales colonized this area. There was a group of six of them that came in in 1990 and 91 and another group of six that arrived in 1999 and 2000. And those two represented the two periods of highest gray whale mortality along the whole West Coast. And what it basically represented is those were years that gray whales were struggling to find food. And these animals probably didn't have enough to feed to make it back up to the Arctic. And that's what led them to search out and exploit this very high risk strategy. Uh, some of the animals are really distinct. This is a uh, uh, patch, 
we like to call it whale 49. Uh, and uh, because uh, it's got this distinct white patch, he's been seen almost every year since 1991 uh, in that area. Uh, and just uh, each row is a different whale. These are years from 1990. And you'll basically, the shaded areas means we saw that whale. And you can just see many of these whales we see every year. Uh, and then you'll see over here that the majority of them are male, but we have a few females. And this whale, 22, I think is pivotal to this group. It's a female, and what's interesting is we've never seen her with a calf. And you'll notice that every like three to five years, she does not show up. And I think those are the years she has a calf. Uh, and I think several things might be going on there. Mothers with calves tend to migrate later. Uh, so maybe because it's later in the year, she proceeds directly. Or it could be a recognition that this would be not a safe place to take your calf and try to feed. Uh, but I think she might be. She's like the highest risk animal of them all. She'll be feeding sometimes up to two kilometers into the mud flat. You know, so a huge distance she has to go to get to deeper water. Now you too can go and watch this. If you have Google Earth, all you have to do like this is the Snohomish River Delta. If you go to the Snohomish River Delta, there's a feature on Google Earth where you hit the clock button and it lets you scroll back and see historical images. And if you scroll back to find any springtime image taken at low tide, and here's one from Google Earth blown up, and these are all gray whale feeding pits visible on Google Earth. And in fact, here we've taken the image and we've now filled in. There's a dot for every feeding pit we had identified uh, on any Google Earth image. Ended up with almost 20,000 feeding pits that can be found on Google Earth in this northern Puget Sound region. We're working on a paper on that. This is a guy named uh, Nathan in our office went through and did this and discovered this. and. You know, and here, this is the edge of the mud flat. And you can see this is over two kilometers into the inside area. So anyway, interesting things. Okay, let's talk about tags and look at a few videos and kind of get into that part. Uh, before I talk about some of the tags, and, and what I'm gonna do is uh, talk a little bit about tags and then a little bit about how we're using them because we've been using these tags to first of all, try to discover aspects of the underwater behavior of these animals that we haven't been able to study, but they also, turn out to be one of the most powerful tools uh, to study how animals react to human activities. So these tags have also become the mainstay of how we've been studying how do animals react to things like maybe mid-frequency sonar, uh, ship noise, or now, and what I'll focus on a little bit, will be how do they react to the approach of ships in terms of avoiding ship strikes. But before I do that, I should just mention there are many types of tags and it's important for you to understand there are, uh, you know, when you hear somebody tagging whales or we're doing tagging whales, we use primarily the top two of these. But there are other research groups like right now, uh, these uh, um, uh, more semi-implantable tags, there's, uh, that's been research that's been done primarily by Oregon State University. Uh, they've tagged over 200 blue whales off the West Coast with that method. Uh, uh, we primarily focused on either the very short-term suction cup, what are called archival tags, meaning rather than transmit information to satellites, they gather data on the tag itself, and you have to get the tag back. The difference that makes is only a very small amount of data can be transmitted to a satellite because it can only be transmitted when the whale's at the surface, only when satellites are in the right position. So you have this very small bandwidth, and only small amounts of data can be transmitted. Historically, those tags have been primarily just giving you a, a, a kind of very crude location uh, with the satellite tag, but because it stays on the whale and you don't have to get it back, you can put it on for a long period of time. You don't have to get it back. Uh, those are getting improved now and there are changes occurring to that. We focused on archival tags where we get that back, but that can mean like the tags we're typically deploying you know, are recording three-dimensional accelerometry, three-dimensional magnetometry, three-dimensional gyroscope, depth, now video, acoustics, and they can do that up to 400 times a second that we're getting data. So a very, very different data stream. The catch is you gotta get the tag back. Uh, and what goes with that is often the attachment method, the primary one we've used, suction cup, is for very short periods of time, you know, hours to a day. 
and so now you're seeing kind of changes occurring. Like we're not, we're now extensively using these medium duration archival tags, where we use uh, now either these improved suction cups or short darts to get durations of two to three weeks on blue whales. And I'll show you some of those results. And also on the satellite tags, you're seeing major improvements in how to transmit additional information. Uh, even having a remote receiver that can get some of that information, you know, not having to transmit it just to the satellite. So we're seeing more data being, got, ga being able to be gathered and uploaded from the satellite tags, and we're seeing major kind of improvements and developments in the kind of uh, durations we can get with our archival tags. So the two are sort of filling in that interesting gap in the middle, if you will. Uh, the evolution of tags, uh, I, I, the earliest tags I deployed were uh, these uh, National Geographic Critter Cams. Uh, I've shown you some of the video from that if you've attended previous talks. The latest of our tags, it's kind of funny. We went from video tags and then we went to strictly data only tags because we really wanted to get the sensor data and digital acoustics that weren't available on things like the Critter Cam. And now we're coming back a little bit to these suction cup attached uh, video cameras because now this is a new tag being developed in collaboration with uh, Stanford uh, and Ari Freelander, uh, Jeremy Goldbogen at Stanford uh, and ourselves and uh, a group called Custom Animal Tracking Solutions, CATS. Uh, and so it's a multi-sensor diving kinematics tag, but it also has video. And I'll show you some of that video coming back to some of these video tags. Uh, deploying, this is from uh, last year uh, in our boat. Uh, this is actually part of an experiment called the, uh, the final year of the behavioral response, SoCal behavioral response study, uh, where, we, where we were deploying tags and looking at how they responded to initially playback of mid-frequency Navy sonar sounds, and then in the last few years, trying to coordinate that with actual Navy activities, either helicopter dipping sonars or Navy ships, uh, where some of these animals carrying these tags, there'd be a baseline period and you'd be able to see normal behavior and then look at the influence it would have when there was Navy sonar going on. Some of that out of coordination with the Navy, but increasingly we found when we put these tags on that were longer duration, we also had incidental, you know, unplanned because there are Navy activities going on that uh, they were exposed to. So this is uh, from last year deploying, it was actually a very thin year for blue whales. Uh, and so we actually, uh, use the services of a spotter plane. Uh, and so this is actually a blue whale the spotter plane put us on, and then he took this photograph uh, right before we deployed this tag on this blue whale. Um, um, I mentioned a lot of our early papers have focused just on the underwater behavior of blue whales that these tags have revealed. Um, you know, I'm going to show you some of the stuff that have come out on gray whales, uh, because what they've actually revealed with gray whales is a lot more social interactions with other whales than we had expected. So not only discovering how they're feeding, but also how they're interacting with each other. And I'll show you some of that video uh, here from that. Uh, I mentioned those intertidal feeding gray whales. Here's a dive record going over. Uh, this is a tag that stayed on 67 hours. It's our longest deployment of a suction cup tag. And I'll show you in the video the reason for it, it turned out, because the gray whales kept having contact with each other, they kept pressing the tag back on. So we got, so we got a 67 hour deployment. And they did other things with the tag that I'll show you. But, uh, but we got this long kind of record. Uh, and these periods you see in blue here are when the whale was feeding. And here you see the tidal cycle. And this is that inner tidal feeding. And you'll see that it's slightly skewed to the rising tide. So they know it's a lot safer to get on at shallow water areas, the tide's coming in, and as soon as it starts going out, it might be time to get off. But you'll see they're spending, we, we thought they were feeding at these other times in these other areas, but it turned out they weren't. And I'll show you, a lot of the time they were going down to the bottom in these areas that we thought were feeding areas, and it turned out they were just lying on the bottom. And I'll show you some of that, it's kind of crazy. Now I mentioned these dart attached tags, these are these darts. Uh, that we get these longer durations on. It's obviously a higher impact uh, type tag. Uh, we feel it's less invasive than some of the deeper implant tags, but you clearly have to recognize that's a higher impact than the suction cup. Uh, and what we've been trying to do is to trade off, you know, when you use a suction cup tag and you only get hours to a day of data, your data is, a, is almost totally biased by what behavior was the whale engaged in when you tagged it. Uh, and when you can get a longer duration, 
you start being able to fill in all of the nighttime behavior of what the whale's doing, and also separating it from the bias of what it was engaged in when you tagged it. And these have given us very, uh, I'll just show you, this is, uh, you know, this is one of the early one of those uh, kind of dart attached archival tags that has a GPS on it. And this shows the tracks of three blue whales just down here in our area. Uh, so we're, this is just south of us, Santa Monica Bay, LA Long Beach. Here are these incredibly busy shipping lanes coming out of LA Long Beach. And these are where the whales were feeding and moving uh, from those tags. And, and the beauty of these is they're giving us this high resolution GPS quality positions. Uh, and we can look at the finer scale movements. So we are both capturing these very localized and detailed movements in and out of shipping lanes. We are also ca capturing, much to our dismay, some long-term movements. And remember, we have to get this tag back. <laughs> Uh, this one came off off southern Baja. I don't know if you guys remember that hurricane that hit down there a couple of years ago. Well, that's when this came off and where it came off. Uh, so it took, uh, I hate to say it, but I think we spent somewhere in the order of five to $7,000 to recover that tag uh, to go down there. And partly, you know, for me, it's partly a question of the tags valuable and the data is valuable, but there's also that part that you've had an impact on the animal there's sort of a responsibility to get that data back. Uh, right now, uh, James, my, uh, one of my right-hand people, <laughs> is right about here at Guerrero Negro. And he's going out to get a tag that we put on about a week ago. And that whale made this trek down and it fell off here. Interestingly enough, that was one of these suction cup attached tags that has these uh, new cups that we're really kind of impressed with. We got about a three-day deployment out of that suction cup attached tag. But in that time, the whale made, that, made it down here. We had one tag that went north. I got that one yesterday. And we had one tag that went south. And he's down there getting that right now. He was headed down there yesterday. And I'm hoping to hear tomorrow morning that he got it. Uh, all of you know that the ship strike issue with blue whales is a major one we're concerned with. Uh, that's one we've been studying since these uh, ship strike deaths that occurred in the fall of 2007 that really kind of first alerted both managers and uh, researchers that the ship strike issue with blue whale was a major concern. That's where we had, you know, four to five blue whales that were documented uh, hit, uh, hit and struck by ships in that one fall period. You know, we were aware of it because in our research, we typically, I mean, these are just photos I routinely take. Many of the areas we see and work with blue whales, you know, are in amongst shipping lanes. Um, so we routinely kind of are in these types of settings. Uh, with these large ships moving through and, and in blue whale feeding areas. Uh, we published a paper. Sorry, the top is cut off. This is a, a paper from 2015. Megan McKenna was the senior author. The main conclusion of it was it showed that one of the reasons blue whales were vulnerable is they were taking almost no evasive action. When we had a ship bearing down uh, on one of these whales, it did not change its direction of travel. Interestingly, it did change its dive behavior but it didn't change its lateral direction of travel. Uh, and that's what that paper kind of concluded. We had a very dramatic case of this in 2014 where we had a blue whale that we had tagged. And while we were tracking it, that's my boat up there, we had the ship come through right along the track where the whale was. And it turned out that whale had gone on a dive and it was coming up right underneath the path of this ship. And, and here you see that blue whales are actually capable of avoiding a ship strike. In this case, this blue whale aborted its surface uh, and dove down below the depth of the hull of that ship uh, and avoided that ship strike. So it was kind of a very near miss. Ironically, this was a whale that our photo ID effort showed. It just kind of maybe, it was a whale uh, we had first identified in 1987. We had frequent sightings off Central California and Southern California. It was one of the two whales, I don't know if you remember, in uh, July 2014 that uh, a uh, <clears throat> small boat that got capsized by a feeding blue whale off San Diego. It was two whale watch captains that were out. It wasn't a whale watch trip, but they were out and they got flipped and he actually videotaped, he was videotaping uh, uh, it so it was captured. Well, this was one of the <laughs> whales. So, so he, he, ha he did that in July of 2014. Uh, and then shortly afterward in September, uh, he was up and almost got run over by the ship. Uh, uh, and I, I do have to admit, he was also part of our experiment of how 
how animals reacted to the playback of mid-frequency sonar. So about two hours before that, he had been exposed to mid-frequency sonar. So just kind of, you know, one whale and three very different sets of, you know, interactions uh, that occurred. Uh, yes, that, in that case, it was one of the playbacks where we actually had a sound source that produces the sound that we call it a scaled source, meaning it only produces the sonar sound because that's all we're capable of producing at about a hundredth the intensity of a real Navy ship. Uh, but it's a way for us to look at behavioral response to very low level source. We were generating it in that case. Uh, you know, movements of these animals, I've just shown some examples. We actually tried to do some playback of ship noise using this giant speaker last year. This is a J-15. Uh, it turned out we're not very good at generating ship noise at the levels a real ship does either because we couldn't get close to a real Navy ship sound. But we did do some control playback. We wanted to see if uh, we could look at how whales responded, the difference between the playback of Navy sonar versus the playback of ship noise. Unfortunately, we couldn't get to very realistic levels of ship noise. So it was a bit of an interesting lesson. Uh, the degree of exposure and risk these animals face was driven home to ship strike, was driven home by this one animal. Uh, this was a tag we deployed in last year in the Gulf of the Farallones off San Francisco. This is its GPS track. There are three sets of shipping lanes that come into San Francisco Bay. It spent time in each one of them. And just in the two weeks that we had this on, I say greater than 10 close ship approaches that actually we're now believe it's 14 times that a ship got close enough that we picked up this very characteristic signature of a close passage of a ship. And it tends to be difficult for us to pick up ship noise on these tags because ship noise is broadband, low frequency, and flow noise going past the tag is also broadband and low frequency. So it tends to mask our ability to detect ships. And we can only detect ships when they're really close and really loud and yet 14 times. Uh, this whale was close enough to a ship that it kind of overcame that flow noise. Uh, so it was just interesting. Again, one whale in 14 days had, you know, 14 of these encounters. Uh, so pretty dramatic. Okay. Well, D Dave Beezer didn't make it. I promised him I would get this in. So uh, this is the data from the tag I picked up yesterday. So, and it didn't fully download. So this is not the whole record yet. This is only part of the record. And this is the data from the satellite. I haven't been able to download the GPS data. And the GPS data we get on these tags is what's called fast lock GPS. You have to download it and then integrate it with data from the satellites. It's not like a normal GPS uh, that, that kind of downloads that data from the satellite. It's a way to shortcut all that, get a snapshot of the satellites, and then you have to process it afterward. But here we are in the Santa Barbara Channel. These are the movements of two whales. And, and, and you'll see that movement from uh, some of you uh, we were talking about ahead of the meeting. We've had whales in the southern part of the Santa Barbara Channel. They've gone from pretty far east to pretty far west. And, and this is just the movements and hits on those two whales. And this will become far more detailed as soon as I get that GPS record. And you can see, especially in the eastern part, it's bordering the shipping lanes there quite a bit. These are two blue whales. Uh, we tagged both of these on 22 June of this year. Uh, as I said, just collected one yesterday. And here you see the dive record, and I actually have the program open. I can, uh, I, I think I, I, I'm just going to jump to the video, but I was potentially going to show you this. Uh, this, uh, this is compressing time. So on this, th this is I can count how many days: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this is the, like the first 13 days: daytime, nighttime, daytime, nighttime. This is how deep the whale was diving. So you can see. Every, every, at nighttime, staying near the surface, daytime, diving. In this case, this is this whale down here you see in this track, diving generally to depths of 150 down to about 300 meters, so diving pretty deep. Some of you have been out, have seen some of these long dives the whales have been on. So sometimes you're feeding down near that maximum uh, depth that blue whales are capable to get down to. And if you blow each of these up, we have, this is data being recorded at, I think, 30 times a second. We have depth data. So if you, you can blow this up and we'll see all of the detail of these dives and the lunges that they're engaged in. So I've just tried to show you that overview because you can see that dramatic difference in day-night behavior that exists. Okay. 
it kind of goes from sun, uh, sunset to sunrise. And, and there is, you, uh, I don't know if, ooh, I didn't quite did the wrong thing there. Uh, they're generally up in that top. Well, okay, now, now you're going to make me do it. See, Let's, she asked the question and we got to answer it. So this is the same record, except now I'm actually on my program that has the data. So let's take one of the days here and we'll go here and I'm going to just make a couple of changes here. It's going to take a second to process this. So now we're in the actual analysis program and we're going to blow up one day in this case here. Okay, so now you see a slight blow up of one day. Daytime, and then you'll see this transition into nighttime where the krill is going closer to the surface. So the whale actually continues to feed shallower and shallower, but then it goes into this non-feeding mode, which is what those shallow dives are. And those are only going down generally to 10 meters, 10, 15 meters. And again, we can blow this up further. I mean, just so you can see some of the, the detail in some of these dives, if we just blow up this section, let's just blow up like, like one or two dive sequences. Let's go like that. So now you're beginning to see each of these is an underwater lunge where the whale is going after krill. And that's some of the detail. There's the surface period. These group very kind of pretty stereotype diving pattern by the whales that some of you have been seeing in the Santa Barbara Channel. Yeah, so in this case here, this is a, 150 meters here, but it went all the way down to 300 meters on other days. It varied between about 150 and 250 meters, uh, depending on day. It shifted around a little bit. Okay, so that's my real recent data. Okay, I think I was going to show a few slides about the SoCal Behavioral Response Study, but I think I just want to jump to the videos because we're already almost at 8 o'clock. Um, so I just want to show a little bit of kind of getting tags on whales. Uh, I will mention that we have a bunch of data on the Behavioral Response Study, the Navy sonar. There are already, I think, uh, something like 15 publications we put out on that study, uh, how blue whales, beaked whales, uh, other species react to mid-frequency sonar, as well as some of the other sideline data that we were able to get. So that's all available. Um, but let's let's look at some of this uh, data from the tags. Uh, and I'll just start picking a few clips. Like, you know, our early deployments of uh, tags on whales look like this. This is putting a, a critter cam. You see how big the tag is? And a younger me, and you have to lay it on there, and there was active suction. Uh, and then this is kind of coming off the tag. This is the, the video off the tag. And here it is on the pole. And here it is landing on the whale. And then you can hear some of the flow noise from my laptop. I didn't hook up sound. It weather vanes to show forward. The body undulations you see are fluke beats, uh, by the way. Also, this is kind of from more than 10 years ago. So that's, that's what that looks like. Uh, in the late 2000s, we got this data. This is from a new uh, critter cam. This was off San Diego and shows a whale feeding uh, on shallower groups of krill. So the tag is on the left side of the body. You'll actually see the head here move around. Like this whale pivots its head around. The pec fin comes out and it turns towards the surface and it spots this ball of krill right there. And that's, it's got that silhouetted. He actually does a full roll and you can see it kind of rotates around and then engulfs a group of krill. Yeah. So, uh, and then, uh, let's see. And this is more recent. This is from 2014. Th these are now D tags, much smaller. Here, this is Ari Freelander, his video, getting the D tag loaded in the holder. We have a lunge feeding blue whale. Right here, this is off Santa Monica Bay, just south of here. He puts that pole out, and in this case, he's going to tap it on right there. That's the tag going on. And now he's, now he's going to get another tag on. And see, here's our blue whale, still right there, with a giant mouth full of krill. <laughs> and, <there's, laughs> and there's another whale over here, and we're going to go tag that other whale. Yeah. So he's getting ready. Okay, and <laughs> now here's my view. I, I'm going to give you three angles of that deployment. 
So here's my view from behind. I'm driving the boat in this case, and here he is. There's that whale has just done this lunge. We kind of, we kind of know he's not very mobile. Uh, and here's where we do that kind of maneuver to get right over. And now you'll notice I'm picking up another video camera and we'll look at a third view. And now, now this is the underwater view. Uh, and so, so here you see the whale underwater and there's the tag. And now you can see that distended uh, I didn't measure this one, but we did do a bunch of measurements and we have worked with others doing aerial photogrammetry. And most of the blue whales we have here get up to about the mid maximum of about 85 feet. And this guy seemed to be pretty big <laughs> uh, from my humble view. <laughs> uh, Let's see. They, they are, but just pretty much in the Antarctic. Uh, and you'll see reports of 110 feet, but where we did some research on that, that tended to be whalers, and they're kind of like fishermen, and you know. <laughs> now, now, this is a tag, and you're actually seeing it slide along the back of the whale here as this whale accelerates. And you get this changing view as it slides backwards. This is a dual video camera. We've got one camera facing forward and one facing off to the left. They, we kind of didn't get it centered. And that's the peck fin sticking out on the left. But you'll see, especially as this whale accelerates, you're going to see the tag sliding backwards. Uh, and, but you're, that, that's going to show that whale engulfing the krill in the throat. By sliding back, it kind of gave us a little different and lower view than we usually get on that. And you can see a bunch of the krill. So this is. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's all the krill that got away. So. Uh, yeah. And then, uh, you know, just one other view of a sliding tag. So, I don't know why these ones that slide kind of, they're, they're kind of fun. So here's the tag on the pole, uh, and we're going to see it go on the whale here. Let's, I may jump ahead. Oh, I'm already on the whale. I'll jump ahead too much. Okay, and here you can kind of get a view. We're approaching the whale. You see that little slick area to the right as the whale's about to surface. And here, here's the landing on the whale view. And, and again, this is one of these dual video cameras. In this case, we got it pretty well positioned. This is looking kind of to the left side of the whale. That's looking to the right side of the whale. And that's the pec fin uh, of the uh, pectoral fin sticking out uh, of the whale. And in this case, this tag also ends up sliding. Uh, and we'll see kind of a little interesting, maybe I, I, I'm going to try to shortcut some of this I, because I want to show you some other good video. So the, see, now our tag has slid a little bit further back. Uh, and, and in the end, let's see, let's get to where it really starts sliding. And I like, I like the sliding video because it gives you a little bit of appreciation of the size of the whale. Oh, I think I'm, I'm sorry. Let's go about here. So it's already slid in part way back. And here we are sliding even further back. <laughs> we're still sliding. <laughs> Uh, and, we're not, and we're not done yet. See, now we're on the bottom of the whale. We get a view we never get before <laughs> on the side of the whale. <laughs> no, not yet. Not yet. We, we've, still got a, we've still got some whale to go here. <laughs> um, let's see if I can, uh, as I said, I don't want to belabor this too long, but uh, good. you're good. <laughs> Okay, we're, we're, I think we're going to start sliding at the next lunge. Because these whales accelerate when they go into a lunge. It's kind of stationary now as it processes this food, but pretty soon it's going to accelerate again. Uh, and that's when the, the tag will start sliding again. Let's go back a little, jump a little more. Okay, maybe now we're gearing up to actually accelerate again. Um, and again, unfortunately, you're just catching a piece of the whale, but you'll see some more whale when this tag starts uh, moving again. So here the whale is starting to accelerate a little bit. You see these body undulations that reflect. Each, when I showed that dive record, you saw each of those upward lunges, and that's what each of these represent. The whale kind of engulfing and stopping, 
It brings the whale almost to a stop. It's a really clear signal on the accelerometers of the tag. We can spot one of these feeding events because nothing else just sort of brings the whale to a stop. And then once it processes uh, that, it's able to then proceed and do another lunge and accelerate again, which is this whale's about to do here. We're still, I think we're gonna catch the last part of, of it sliding down the whale here. Uh, and we'll see where the fluke actually is. Okay, we're starting to starting to get going here. If I have the right video, of course. <laughs> Maybe I may be setting this up <laughs> for disappointment here. But I think we'll get a final slide, but we'll see. Yes, maybe. Oh, here we go. Yes, yes. Oh, we're starting to move. Yeah, here we go. Oh, there's the fluke. Now we got the fluke. So anyway, that's the final slide. Maybe a little anticlimactic, okay, uh, for that. Um, and I did want to show, we did work with uh, some film crews, and uh, some of you may have seen, there was a show called The Hunt uh, that was uh, aired, and this is some of the footage we got. So this is now from a cameraman underwater, just so you can see a little bit of that different view of what these lunges look like. So that's a blue whale that's engulfed a bunch of surface krill. Uh, and right now, so here it is, you'll actually see this changing and it's filtering it through the side of its mouth. And that's, and just see that all changing shape. So that's a real beautiful view. As I said, this is a show you can actually access it online on our website, it's called The Hunt, and, and I'm not even showing you some of the best footage that uh, we were able to obtain working with these camera crews of these whales feeding in clear water. This is uh, off Southern. I think maybe I'll show you one more of that. This. It's really hard to get these images because blue whales are usually feeding in highly productive areas where the water clarity isn't good. This is a rare case where we had these blue whales feeding in this clear water. So uh, very hard to get this kind of footage. Uh, very little. You know, they will occasionally get gross. They'll get barnacles that will grow on the end of their uh, dorsal fins, but largely they're, they're pretty clean. And they'll also have remora suckerfish that will uh, occasionally uh, be on as well. Uh, nothing like uh, gray whales or humpback whales. Yes, yes. For example, this video, which I think is the best video I've got. So this is deploying on a group of humpback whales, uh, a dual camera. This is a group, you can see it's a mixed species, a group of humpback whales feeding on anchovies with seabirds and with sea lions. This is the view of the tagger in front. This is my view from behind, and then it's going to switch to a forward and back view off the tag. This is a tag that has a video camera facing forward and backwards. Uh, so very gingerly entering this because it's kind of a crazy thing. But here we are, we're in the right spot. There we go. So there the tag went on, uh, right on midline on the back on that whale, and now I kind of back away uh, from that. And now looking straight backwards, you'll see the fluke and the dorsal fin, and looking straight forward on this. Uh, and now you can see a lot of the things growing, but now you see sea lions coming into view, other, other humpback whales feeding, uh, and this is the unedited first two minutes of a four-hour video. Uh, uh, so just, just the first two minutes. Uh, and, and you'll see that's actually a school of anchovy right there. there there's one anchovy that got away. <laughs> Uh, and here's a collision with another whale. Oop, oh. <laughs> and now you'll see the birds come off and pick off the straggler. <laughs> uh, that's the antenna from the tag. And there you see us in our boat behind there on the right. <laughs> uh, so you know, there were, there were some real surprises out of this. We're working up a paper on this because uh, we know humpback whales as this, these incredible cooperative feeders. 
but actually this video tends to show a little more on the competition side between the whales and actually interesting cooperation between the sea, with the sea lions and birds because uh, humpback whales need the prey to be concentrated tightly together. Whereas the schooling effect of uh, the anchovies is what resists predators like birds and sea lions that pick them off one at a time. So this is sort of the deadly one too. See, here's a whale, it's best to avoid that whale. What we end up seeing is this whale, the majority of the time it tries to approach the school of anchovies, it has to pull away because another whale has beaten it to it. So I think, you know, see right there, that's the school of anchovy and this whale turns away because another whale has beaten it to it. So that great cooperative feeding that the Southeast Alaska whales have worked out, well, our guys haven't quite figured that out yet. So here he is, he's getting, they, he goes into the school of anchovy again right there, he beats that whale to it. Uh, and he did get a successful mouthful right there, uh, but he had to maneuver in amongst these other animals. But you can see these birds and sea lions are really concentrated to, in the rear view because when the humpback breaks up the school, those animals can come in and pick off the individual fish. And I think the fish then aggregate together and then the humpback can get them. So it's an interesting cooperation between the species. And in this case, they haven't quite worked out the cooperation amongst each other. Uh, but you can clearly see why it would be advantageous for humpback whales to work out a scheme because in this sort of chaotic uh, setting that they were operating in here, they were often being ineffectual uh, in doing it. Uh, yep, and I'll show you a quick video. You know, this is the sort of thing that we can do with the tag data. We can reconstruct all the underwater behavior of the whale. And again, I'm gonna jump ahead and just show you that, uh, uh, oh, maybe it's not gonna move at all. Oh, good, maybe the video won't even play. Never mind. I won't show you that. <clears throat> um, Let's see, I'm going to show you uh, a little bit of gray whale data and then I think we might call it at that and take your questions at that point. Um, let's see, uh, skip those deployment videos. Oh, I did want to show you like our most recent deployment because this is, you know, sometimes the deployments don't go really well, but sometimes they do go really well. And one of our recent deployments, I think was one of the most successful uh, kind of textbook deployments. I do, I do like showing showing them when it works just right. Uh, if it should be whale pooping, yeah, let's not get into that one. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> You're not supposed to see that title. Okay, so uh, so here it is. This is from, uh, yeah, this is from uh, early July. Maybe my videos are gonna have trouble playing, here we go. So this is my video. Uh, so yeah, July 6th. So we're dealing with what, about a week ago? Uh, and uh, this is down off San Diego, uh, part of a study we were actually doing with Scripps uh, uh, and some of the offshore moorings they have that are monitoring uh, prey density. So we were deploying on some of the whales. So there you see the blue whale up ahead uh, and that we're coming in. We'll try to get kind of our timing just right. I'll slow down here to kind of be poised to wait till where it'll be just at the right time to accelerate. So right there, we're watching for the whale to commit. Right there, it commits, so we come up. Yeah. So that sort of, yeah, makes it look easy when it goes like that. I won't show you some of the other videos that <laughs> go the other way, but, but anyway. Um, yeah. Um, so let's show you a couple of these gray whale ones just because I, uh, actually, let me find the right one here, sorry. Uh, okay, yeah, this one here. So this kind of shows you, in this case, uh, this is some of the data stream off the tag, and this is some of the video superimposed with it. This is gonna change. So now you'll see this line is gonna scroll across. These are all the different sensors on the tag, and these are being plotted. Like you can pay attention in blue is the depth uh, of the animal. We have speed of movement. Uh, we have acceleration, we have roll. So this is a blue whale. This is actually that female I mentioned, whale 22, which we've named uh, Earhart after Amelia Earhart, one of the pioneers of this area. This is a gray whale. I've shifted to gray whales on you. Uh, and so we have this tag perfectly set up. You can see it's nicely aimed forward. There it's doing a little pass on the bottom, but it doesn't stop the feed. In this case, it keeps going. 
Uh, and everything seems to be going pretty well with the tag. We're really happy with the deployment. It's, it's facing perfectly forward just the way we want it. And then uh, I'll jump ahead a little bit to, let's go to about here maybe. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Okay, that's the right spot. So we have it at just the right spot, and uh, we're happy with us. And this is within five minutes. Uh, we're at time five minutes into the deployment. That ends up being a pretty long deployment, and we wanted to get this forward view so we could document the feeding behavior of these gray whales and how they feed on that bottom intertidal area. We are largely trying to learn how using the video, which only records for four hours when is it feeding and look uh, use that to then interpret the sensors that can keep recording for days uh, to interpret the signal uh, from the sensor data. So there's our tag nicely facing forward and everything going pretty smoothly. Now you're going to see a whale come into view here. There were a couple of other whales uh, with this particular whale. They were, this is a female that's tagged, one of our few females, and then she had three males swimming with her. And here comes one of them right here. and turns the tag around so it's facing exactly backwards. <laughs> Which is maybe kind of convenient because now it's gonna film the other males, like there's the whale that just turned it around. <laughs> uh, and, it, and it turned out to be, you know, this was kind of very disappointing initially, but then we, it kind of revealed some of these intense social interactions that were going on with these whales. You're actually gonna see all three whales come into view here following this whale around. So here you have one whale coming to view, and this is the video facing straight back and this off to the side. So this is the nose of that whale coming into view here. And you can just see how they just kind of travel with each other. Uh, I, I never quite appreciated that three-dimensional space in which they kind of operate and swim together uh, and just kind of coast along. They're kind of making these frequent contacts with pec fins and with body. Uh, with other whales, and now you're going to see another whale come into view in the middle. Here comes another whale. So now you've got two whales in view with this other whale, and now you're going to see a third whale come into view. So you have all three whales just traveling along uh, with this whale. And, and it was just surprising to see kind of the level of interaction these whales had. Now I don't want to portray that the, way, the whales ended up doing us favors in other cases. I mentioned those really long deployments. Uh, that we had and uh, I'm going to show maybe one more video. I know you it's sweet. you guys have gone. So, so here you go. So now here's a tag and you can see this tag is getting loose. You see that wobble? It's probably only hanging on by one suction cup and it's facing straight backwards uh, on this. This is on a different whale, not that other whale. And you can see, so tag is kind of getting loose uh, and facing backwards. And here, once again, <laughs> yeah, I mean, isn't, is that a, isn't that a face you can love? And here's two whales. <laughs> and they're both just scraping against this whale. Uh, the tag actually doesn't end up getting contacted there at all. If you're quick, there's actually a penis that's uh, sticking out of one of the two whales. It went by real quick. It, it, uh, you might have caught it. Uh, so here comes right there. Right there, they just pressed that tag on. You see it's not jiggling anymore. And now it's faced perfectly forward. Uh, and you'll see this is going just right of the head and this is just left of the head. So it ended up being this really perfectly spaced uh, you know, tag. And you'll see here uh, when the whale surfaces that we just have a perfect view forward. Uh, so as I said, we got these really long deployments even though the whales kept sort of turning the tags around. No, these are adults. We These are animals that we've seen for 25 years. Uh, so we, we know a lot about them. Um, yeah, I, I think I'll just stop there. Uh, on our website, uh,
So if you go if you go to CascadiaResearch.org, there's a link to our YouTube channel, and I have a bunch of these videos on that YouTube channel. I've done a terrible job of promoting it. They they haven't gone viral. Uh, they only have hundreds to a few thousands hits, so you can help boost it. Uh, yes. I was out Friday on uh, the Condor. And I was out Friday on the Condor, and we came across this whale has a huge hump on the back. Yeah. And it's you know, uh, Dave Beezer said it was named Camello. Right. And, and uh, you know the reason why that hump is, uh, is on there? We do uh, not. You, you're, it, you're familiar with that. Yes, it's about. a whale we've seen for quite a while, and there have been a number of whales that have had these kind of disfigurements that have surprisingly survived. Because it's huge. It's, it's almost like the belly on the top. Yeah, it's, it's a huge swelling, and, it, and he has had it for a long time. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'm pretty sure I do, but I'll, might, you might have to double check that with me. Uh, yes, back here. I've been out in the last few days too, and we've seen a lot of pelagic crabs around. I wonder if have you seen any feeding of blue whales on the pelagic crabs? I understand they do that once right. in a while. They do, uh, and they did a lot of that. Surprisingly, we had some of that last year. Uh, I have not heard of or seen feeding yet. I've seen the pelagic red crab. You know, it's it is a favorite prey of blue whales, especially on the west coast of Baja. I actually had a unique experience where we were in our small 14-foot inflatable boat off. Uh, Punta San Lazaro off Southern Baja. It was, we'd gone there to try to study uh, blue whales off the west coast of Baja. And we had these huge groups of blue whales feeding on solely pelagic red crab. And actually had this unique experience of being, having this huge swarm of pelagic red crab right next to the boat and having a blue whale engulf them. And the thing that still sticks in my mind is just as they were being engulfed, you could see all of them put their pincers out. <laughs> And it was just sort of like this priceless image of, you know, <laughs> I don't know if they, if they bite the blue whale's tongue or, or what they do, but I can just still see them doing that. On that same day, I heard that you were, we were on the, this side of the channel, and I heard you were on San Miguel on the back side, and while we were seeing 20 or 30, or no, maybe not that many, maybe 15 blue whales, you were seeing 100 on the back side of San Miguel. Any, any... Any thoughts about the the food supply on one side versus the other, or, yes. the, or the? Yes, and this was so. This was just a little over a week ago, week and a half ago, something like that. Uh, it was actually a very late. I only headed for San Miguel. We'd been working with the whales in the channel, and I got a report from one of the biologists that works on the island uh, at one thirty in the afternoon. So I made a run for San Miguel, starting at one thirty. Uh, so we did. We didn't have a lot of time there, uh, but we made this pass through there, and it was well over 100 blue whales in a very quick pass. Uh, it is an area where our tags have revealed those whales are feeding really deep. Our record dives for blue whales of over 350 meters, so over 1,000 feet, come from that area. So they're right at that drop off. I think it's a challenging area for them to feed. But I, we're thinking about trying to write something up about that area, because this is probably the 10th year that we've had over 100 blue whales in that area. I don't know if it is. I mean, I think of it just as the drop off there south of Richardson and uh, south of Point Bennett there along that stretch. And we did a bunch of cruises with the sanctuary vessel Shearwater, where we did some oceanographic surveys through those areas and, and had those huge concentrations. So it is, it's, it's, it's the biggest concentrations of blue whales I've ever seen, like the top 10 biggest concentrations have all been in that area in different years. So it's a, re a remarkable area, really tough weather, Really hard to get to uh, area, but it is, it's is—it's an impressive area. We have a cruise in August uh, with Stanford, an NSF-funded cruise, looking at the feeding of different large whales. Jeremy Goldbogen is the PI at Stanford, and we're, we are going to try to focus on that region because I think it's a real unique region. And that'll include some of these tag deployments, uh, oceanographic prey mapping, and some drone-based uh, measurements of the whales that are feeding in that area. Two weeks. Uh, right in the middle of August, is, uh, we'll have that group. Uh, we'll go out, we'll have the truth and two of our rigid hold inflatables that we'll base from. Yes. Yeah. These look like our tag whales from Sakulina, yes. the eastern bank, and actually coming across, uh, tag the whales from up there, coming across with our group and giving birth down in the Gulf and having the same tag, tag verification back up in Sakulina? Yeah. That 
It's been one of the bizarre things. We thought we knew everything about gray whales and their migration. Uh, and the view was there was this western gray whale population that numbered just 150 animals or so, one of the most endangered whale populations. But again, it's one of the benefits of those satellite tags. This was uh, tags deployed by Bruce Mate uh, in two different years. Uh, the whales that got satellite tagged ended up coming over and coming over to the eastern North Pacific breeding areas. The funny part is that as that whale was about halfway across, I got a call from Dave Weller, who's a researcher that does photo ID on the Western gray whales. And he saw that track. He called me and said, John, we have a catalog of gray whales and you have a catalog of gray whales and we've never thought to compare those. Uh, so I'm gonna send you my catalog right now. And we end, we've ended up with over 20 matches of animals seen off Washington and the Pacific Northwest that have been these Western gray whales on route. And it included that exact whale that had been tagged. Yeah, it's a huge distance. They're going across. It's, it's, it's really thrown a bit of confusion uh, and it's still unresolved into what is the status of Western gray whales. Uh, because there used to be a Western gray whale population. Uh, it was thought to be distinct. It was thought to breed in the water somewhere off China. Uh, it may still exist, but it turns out the majority of these Sakhalin animals are animals coming from the east. So is there still a remnant Western population that intermixes? Does it go to a different feeding area? What is the status? It's really kind of uh, the species we thought we had this figured out. It's thrown this kind of real puzzle piece in it. And recently there's been some interesting data on acoustic detections of gray whales actually south of Japan that may be some of those Western animals. So there, there's some interesting developments still coming out about uh, gray, uh, gray whales and their population. We yeah. have uh, time for one more question. Oh, just uh, so it's like a technical question, but how do you how are you able to legally approach the whales when there's like that legal proximity yes. of like 200 feet with right. the vessel being yeah. off? Yeah. Re really, it's, it's it's the perfect question. I'm really glad you asked it uh, uh, because the Marine Mammal Protection Act does make it illegal to approach, to tag, to do all the things that we do, and that's why it can only be done under a scientific research permit. Uh, we have to get that. Uh, those are issued by National Marine Fisheries Service. Uh, ironically, I have a five-year permit and it's uh, expiring in two days. But they promised me my renewal will arrive tomorrow. <laughs> so it, we're cutting it a little thin on, on that one. Uh, but yes, yeah, so, and, and basically our permit application is about 40, 50 pages long. You have to justify you know, the status of these populations you know, because we're doing approaches for photo ID. We're doing kind of drone-based flights on our animals. You know, we're attaching tags, we're taking skin samples, all of these things, playing back sounds, all of those require permits to do it. So we have to get these permits uh, to do that. You have to justify and explain, uh, you know, why you're doing it and show it's beneficial uh, to the management protection of the animals. So it's a really important thing that I should mention with every presentation. Okay, I'll stick around, guys. Thank you. <laughs>